The 19th century marked the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. The rapid urbanization and hence the decentralization of industry saw the progressive development of industrial facilities and factories on the outskirts of the inner city, some distance from residential homes. This led to an increase in home-to-work commuting, a definable attribute to the polarization of gender roles. Previously, home businesses and smaller communities allowed for women to assist with family businesses, possibly working as a store clerk or completing other small tasks. But the domestic role of the female became heavily defined as the male figures were required to work outside of home, strengthening the social sphere of their role in supporting the family financially. Despite the common occurrence amongst aristocrats, and upper-class families to have domestic duties carried out by servants, females were still majorly restricted by their socially allocated duties and were left to oversee domestic tasks. As for the household, well, the maids know about running everything better than I do. The popularization of Darwinian theory as well as the medicinal practices of the contextual time frame contributed to the pseudoscientific belief that the male was biologically superior to the female, with traits of dominance, independence, and rationality being expected of them, whilst characteristics of passivity, over-emotionalness, chastity, and lack of ambition were expected of females. In the play, A Doll's House, Henrik Ibsen characterizes Torvald Helmer to embody these social constructs, setting them up to be later challenged. The core belief system that society, and thereby Torvald holds, is illustrated to, through Torvald's supercilious and patronizing conduct towards Nora, representing society's disdainful view on women. This is especially evident in the manner that Torvald addresses Nora, with endearments such as Skylark or Squirrel, more as how a strict parent would admonish and entertain a mischievous child, or would yield to the whims of a domestic pet, rather than how one would treat a wife as an equal. His playful friendliness is often insulting. A little spending bird been throwing money away again. And his frequently lecturing tone helps to establish his own view of himself in the minds of the audience. In Torvald's eyes, this is what a perfect wife is meant to be in society. An object that a husband would play with for amusement. To be dressed up like a doll and presented to the world on a mantelpiece. Sexuality expressed by females was seen as obscure and undesirable. Dr. William Acton wrote in 1860 that the majority of women, happily for them, are not very much troubled with sexual feelings of any kind. No nervous or feeble young man need, therefore, be deterred from marriage by an exaggerated notion of the duties required from him. The married woman has no wish to be treated on the footing of a mistress. Women found themselves constantly balancing their image, hoping to find a husband without appearing to forward in their pursuits. Being forward in the company of men suggested a worrying sexual appetite. Women were assumed to desire marriage solely because it allowed for them to become mothers. Marriage was a construct separate from sexual or emotional satisfaction. A similar balancing act was found in the realm of intellectual pursuit. Middle-class girls were encouraged to practice what was known as accomplishments, music, singing, dancing, embroidery, etc., to appeal to possible husbands. Yet those who devoted themselves too enthusiastically to their studies were labelled a blue stocking. It was considered unfeminine and off-putting to desire intellectual knowledge, as it was regarded as an attempt to usurp men's biological intellectual superiority. Some doctors even held the belief that too much studying was damaging towards their ovaries, turning attractive young women into dried-up prunes. The 19th century gave rise to a moral panic regarding prostitution. Women began to collectively demand male continence outside marriage, as was expected of them. Towards the end of the century, a socially controversial topic was that of the virginal bride and her children infected with syphilis by a sexually experienced man. Political and personal demands for equality coined the slogan, votes for women, chastity for men. Henrik Ibsen touches upon the differences found between males and females when it comes to their sexual prowess through the character of Dr. Rank. He actually suffers from a very serious illness. It's wasting away his spine, poor thing. You see, his father was a horrible man who had mistresses and and so on, and so Dr. Rank had been delicate since he was a child. The doctor is infected with spinal tuberculosis, now known to actually be syphilis, due to his father's irresponsible actions. 
Nora's sympathetic response to his illness depicts her acknowledgement of the male sexuality. Initially, Nora embodies her expected role of sexual passivity, but in a later scene with Dr. Rank, Nora is giddy and flirtatious in a sexually manipulative manner, pointing towards Nora's greater knowledge of the distinguished sexualities of the two genders, and is perhaps suggestive of her own sexuality. Henrik Ibsen's play is interpreted as a reflection as to the differences in the rule of law and the rule of love, where society's constructs and regulations are questioned by Norma Nora Helmer. The 19th century saw a very limiting scope of laws which constricted the wife greatly. Up until 1882, when the Married Property Act was passed, the entirety of a woman's wealth was passed to her husband, and any earnings made if the woman did happen to work were also property of her husband. Females lacked tenureship and stood to lose everything, including custodial rights, in the rare case of a divorce. The Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed for men to divorce their wives in the case of adultery, but the same did not apply for females who had found their husbands to be unfaithful. Children became the man's property in the event of a divorce, and the mother could quite possibly be prevented from seeing her children entirely. Further restrictions were placed upon a female's ability to work independently, as the law prevented them from investing, loaning, and owning land. This is a focal point in A Doll's House, as Nora illegally forges her father's signature to save her husband from tuberculosis. The entire problem arises from Nora's inability to save her husband legally, and is therefore forced to resort to legal measures. Ibsen attempts to frame Nora's transgression as an act out of desperation, with noble intentions, with her exclamation, No, it was impossible. The trip was to save my husband's life, as I told you. This led the 19th century audience to not immediately condemn her act, but instead to empathize with Nora and question the morality of such a decision, challenging the stringent social principles of the time, especially with regards to women's rights, which the lack of caused the entire situation. These restricting laws soon altered in the following years, with the Married Women's Property Act in 1882 in the United Kingdom and France granting women the rights to own bank accounts in 1881. In many ways, Ibsen was a pioneer. His views on the social constructs of marriage and gender roles were ahead of his time, resulting in the outrage response that followed the debut of the play. Ibsen's At All House was released at the brink of the social revolution of women's rights, which then went on to abolish the aforementioned societal views on gender roles in marriage.